Professor Alexi, dear Professor Kuppe, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you very much for inviting me to this symposium. <clears throat> and I want to talk about cardiopulmonary bypass, blood, and drugs during arterial switch operation from the point of view of an anesthesiologist. That's what I talk, uh, that's, um, what I talk about, preoperative assessment, the anesthetic management, our comprehensive blood sparing approach, and I want to demonstrate you in a short form our own preliminary results. There are different forms of malposition, double outlet right, double outlet left, and the anatomically corrected malposition, which is a rare condition and means that the great vessels connect with the appropriate ventricle, but in a manner different than normal, but that's not the theme for today. A fourth type of malposition is the detransposition of the great arteries. Explaining the term DTGA to you is, I think, like carrying colds to Newcastle, but uh, in a few seconds, like anesthesiologists normally do, I want to explain it to you. Transposition means in this way that the left ventricle gives rise to the main pulmonary artery and the right ventricle to the aorta. Current estimates place the incidence of TGA between 0.02 and 0.05% of all live births, and this entity makes up approximately 5% of all children with congenital heart disease. We have to keep it in mind that transposition of great arteries means in some cases not only a cyanotic heart disease, but also a mixing lesion with an increased pulmonary blood flow. Newborns with TGA and intact ventricular septum with a small PFO or ASD have severe cyanosis on the first day of life, sometimes with acidosis and cardiovascular collapse. Those with TGA and VSD or TGA with a large ASD or PDA have a better mixing and hence a higher PO2. But they also have a greater tendency to develop congestive heart failure. As far as I know, there are no characteristic features on clinical examination, chest radiography, or electrocardiography that reliably allow differentiation the diagnosis TGA from other causes of neonatal cyanosis. Therefore, the gold standard for finding the right diagnosis is the TTE. The life-threatening scenario of the disease is the arterial desaturation caused by parallel circulation. And the main task of the anesthesiologist in the operating room preparing a newborn for an arterial switch operation is to do everything for an ongoing uneventful mixing of the circulation until the heart-lung machine is ready to go. Hemoglobin oxygen saturation and the severity of the clinical picture will be greatly influenced by the amount of mixed carval and pulmonary venous blood. Otherwise, arterial saturation will fluctuate with changes in pulmonary function and shunt fraction, and um, as well as in changes with hemoglobin temperature and cardiac output. And it's important for us to identify those children for acute pulmonary uh, congestion or poor systemic perfusion preoperatively as they must be managed very carefully before cardiopulmonary bypass can be instituted. Infants receiving prostaglandin, especially in doses exceeding 0.05 microam per kilogram minute, minute, should be assessed for side effects, including apnea, hypertension, fever, central nervous system excitation, and decreased intravascular volume. By the way, the last point, decreased intravascular volume, is in some cases a very good excuse for us in having problems in placement of a central venous line. Routine balloon atrioseptostomy converts the arterial switch operation to a semi-electric procedure. 
children, maybe 15 to 20 percent, who cannot maintain adequate oxygenation after balloon atrial septostomy, <coughs> will of course require early operation. Prematurity, prematurity and low birth weight are relative but not absolute contraindications. One of our smallest successful operated patient with DTGA was a neonate with a weight of 1.7 kilogram. But occasionally a baby with TGE cannot undergo early, early atrial switch operation because of late presentation, late diagnosis, or intercurrent medical problems such as neck or other septic conditions, then our experience and that of others support a primary arterial switch operation up to an age of eight weeks. The key points pre-remer are a sure adequate mixing of systemic and pulmonary venous blood, confirm an adequate left ventricle mass and function, and evaluate the coronary anatomy. I don't want to bore you with our routine monitoring tools, but the last topping, the near-infrared spectroscopy, plays an important role in our blood sparing approach. At the end of my lecture, I want to underline some facts about the usefulness of NEARS in the operating room. The induction of anesthesia is done with midazolam, sofentanil, and pancuromium for relaxation, followed by an uninterrupted infusion of sofentanil and propofol. In a study from Anand and co-workers, it was underlined that the stress response to major cardiac surgery and neonatal patients, as measured by changes in adrenal hormones, cortisol, glucose, and lactate, is significantly reduced in the highest dose of fentanyl group compared with other medications. And also, propofol is a very useful drug. Its long-term use as an ICU sedative is contraindicated. Besides a modest reduction in systolic blood pressure, the major concern with propofol is the potential for the propofol infusion syndrome. That means lactate acidosis, rhabdomyolysis, cardiac and renal failure, which is generally associated with a high mortality, almost up to 100%. Here you have a schematic picture of a mitochondria. The deadly mechanism of the so-called propofol infusion syndrome is postulated to be due to restruction of fatty acid, acid oxidation caused by impaired entry of long chain fatty acids in the mitochondria. And finally, a failure of the beta oxidation in the mitochondrial respiratory, respiratory chain. Excuse me. However, Propofol is used off license by many pediatric intensive care units in Germany. And the majority of users has adopted tightly controlled regimens for propofol sedation and limits the dose to three to four milligram per kilogram an hour and the maximum application time to 24 to 48 hours. If you on one hand talk about side effect of anesthetic agents, we have to talk on the other hand about other risk of complications during pediatric cardiac surgery. Besides uh, its obvious benefits, oxygen carrying capacity, tissue oxygenation and coagulation, blood transfusion is known to be associated with substan substantial changes, changes in the immune system and capable of provoking a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Most of these outline techniques to minimize the need for donor blood are not applicable for the newborn, which has to be operated within the first weeks, first week of life. The only drug we routinely use is tranexamic acid in order to reduce any kind of hyperfibrinolysis. Martin and co-workers found out that in, a, that in pediatric patients there is a noticeable tendency to an increased rate of seizures, where the doses used in their protocol was tenfold higher than we use it in our center. The in, 
inevitable consequence of every cardiopulmonary bypass circus is hemodilution. And in a joint effort of surgeons, perfusionists, and anesthesiologists, our cardiopulmonary bypass circuit used in pediatric surgery was redesigned to minimize the priming volume. The expected benefits of this approach are reduced need for transfusion of homologous blood and better preservation of the coagulatory system. In the past, the normal priming volume of a heart-lung machine designed for neonates was many times over the circulating blood volume of the individual child. The smallest priming volume today is approximately 90 to 95 milliliter in comparison to an expected blood volume of the child of about 300 milliliter. There were some studies done in the past showing blood sparing effects by minimizing the cardiopulmonary circuit. Our study differs from these previous reports by including only neonates with body weight between 1.7 and 4.2 kilogram undergoing a complex surgical procedure of an arterial switch operation. Between April 2007 and December 2009, 23 neonates were treated by the arterial switch operation with the application of our blood sparing approach. This included the use of a low priming volume, the avoidance of all additional hemodilution by minimizing blood sampling, meticulous surgical technique to reduce bleeding, and a tolerated transfusion trigger of hemoglobin concentration about seven gram percent. And finally, NIRS, near infrared spectroscopy, to ensure the maintenance of cerebral and peripheral oxygenation. What did we find out? Surgery could be done without blood transfusion in 74% intraoperatively. Three children in the transfusion group got not only red blood cells, they were additionally transfused with fresh, fresh frozen plasma. From 17 children, free of transfusion in the operating room, 11 were transfused in ICU. That means, in other words, six, six newborns, or around 25% of all operated children, were discharged from our hospital without any blood transfusion after complex heart surgery. This figure shows you the curse of the blood hemoglobin concentration during the time of operation. Preoperative hemoglobin level was higher in the group without intraoperative need for transfusion. And during cardiopulmonary bypass, hemoglobin essential, remained essentially unchanged in this group and increased only slightly after termination of cardiopulmonary bypass and the retransfusion of the priming volume. And the lowest value is in almost every case the result of hemodilution after initiation of the cardiopulmonary bypass. To recognize and avoid regional ischemia, we used near infrared spectroscopy for monitoring of brain and lower body tissue oxygenation. NIRS is an optical technology that has been shown to measure a mixed cerebral or likewise peripheral vascular oxygen saturation, including capillaries, venules, arterioles. With the use of phase shifted infrared light, where oxygenated and desoxygenated hemoglobin have distinct absorption spectra. That's a picture that uh, shows you what we not do in the operating room. I think that's only for uh, scientific work. That's an optical tomography, a picture from London. That's not uh, applicable for routine practice, but what we do looks uh, this way. We've normally fixed measuring optodes uh, to the infant's forehead below the hairline, and a second one simultaneously to the, um, to the lower leg. The tissue oxygenation index is the relationship, also the tissue oxygenation index measured by the NIRS device is the relationship between oxyhemoglobin and the global content of hemoglobin. Preoperative -op, pre cerebral tissue oxygenation was similar in both groups and was significantly increased in children in the group with blood transfusion during cardiopulmonary bypass. But also in the group without transfusion, 
there was a tendency for increased cerebral tissue oxygenation index during CPB, indicating good maintenance of cerebral oxygenation despite hemodilution. Lower body tissue oxygenation also increased in both groups and was finally higher um, in both groups at the end of the operation. The major limitation of this report is the small sample size. We know there were no differences among the groups concerning in-hospital outcome, such as duration of ventilation and ICU stay or incidence of post-operator complications. Otherwise, we were not able to show potential benefits by avoiding transfusion. The most relevant outcome parameter, the mental and psychomotor development, was not assessed at all. I think that's a, that's a big limitation of this study, but we plan it for the future time. However, the goal of the study was to demonstrate how a stringent blood sparing approach, including a very low priming volume of CPB, would affect intraoperative hemodilution and the need for transfusion of homologous blood products. Whether this approach has the potential to actually improve outcome and what the safe, safe hematocrit level might be have to be evaluated in future studies. Generally spoken, the post-CPB management includes the interpretation of hemodynamic data, preserve hemostasis, prevent a capillary leak syndrome, increase and eventually low cardiac output, and use transesophageal echocardiography in cases where we detect or where we have the suspicion that there is a problem with the coronary arteries. But not all segmental wall motion abnormalities may be an indicator of ischemia. The etiology of segmental wall motion abnormalities immediately after cardiopulmonary, bi cardiopulmonary bypass could include reversible physiologic changes that produce standard or the hibernating myocardium. But in cases of elevated cardiac troponin, myocardial injury is the likely cause. It can be postulated that persistent severe segmental wall motion abnormalities found in neonates after an arterial switch operation defines a group of patients at increased risk for myocardial ischemia. The key points post repair are concentrated and managed coagulopathy and bleeding from extended suture lines, assess regional wall motion abnormalities, and early diagnosis and treatment of arrhythmias. If we need postoperatively a higher degree of inotropic support, I would say more than 0.05 to 0.1 microgram per kilo and minute epinephrine, we have to think about an angiography or a surgical revision of the coronary translocation. It is not an exaggeration to say that fortunately almost all of our neonates with transposition of the great arteries show an unspectacular perioperative cause, last but by the way not least, as a consequence of an excellent surgical practice. Thank you very much. <laughs>